Can you let me in? We're not live, right? Damon. Damon, will you let me in? Okay. Uh, yeah. Yeah, good. Yep. Good to go. Okay, I would like to call the Reading Board of Education organizational meeting to order. Roll call, please. Ms. Summers here. Ms. Menner here. Mr. Perdue here. Ms. Tomlin here. Ms. Warnery here. Would everyone please rise for the Pledge of Allegiance? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay, okay, resolution 01-22, approval of the agenda. Do I have a motion and a second? I'll make a motion. Second. I have a motion by a second by Amy Fallman. Uh, roll call vote, please. Ms. Bemis? Yes. Ms. Menner? Yes. Mr. Perdue? Yes. yes. Ms. Tallman? Yes. Ms. Warnery? Yes. Motion passes by vote. I would like to uh, welcome everybody that's out there. We don't have anybody except uh, the Reading staff that's uh, involved. So uh, welcome everybody. Uh, this is the organizational meeting. And as soon as we uh, get the president elected, uh, I will bow out and they will take over. So bear with us. Next item that we have is resolution 02-22. Oath of office of all new board members, which there are four of us. Mm -hmm. And all four of you, if you stand up, I'm going to read the statement and raise your right hand. And then after I finish reading the statement, you'll just say, yes, I do. Like, do you solemnly swear that you will support the Constitution of the United States and the Constitution of the state of Ohio, and that you will faithfully and impartially discharge your duties as members of the Board of Education of the Reading Community City School District, Hamilton County, Ohio, to the best of your ability, and in accordance with the laws now in effect and hereafter to be enacted during your continuance in said office and until your successor is elected and qualified. I do. Yes, I do. Great. Congratulations. There is an oath of office. If you have not signed it, please sign it and um, pass it to me, and I will have that filed. Okay. Thank you, new board. Okay, item number three, resolution 0322, election of the president. A is I would like to have a motion and a second to open the nom nominations uh, for president. Make a motion to open nominations. A second. I have a motion by Beth Warnery, second by Amy Tallman to open the nominations. Roll call vote, please. Ms. Bennett? Yes. Ms. Menner? Yes. Mr. Perdue? Yes. Ms. Hallman? Yes. Ms. Warner? Yes. No. Motion carries 5 0. Okay. okay. Would anybody, anybody um, um, would like, like to nominate by name the individual that they would like to be president of the board? I nominate Beth Warnery. Okay, do we have anybody else that would like to nominate anyone? Okay, I need a motion and a second to close the nomination. All motion to close the nomination. Second. Okay, I have a motion to close the nominations by Crystal, second by Amy Tallman. Roll call vote, please. Ms. Bennett? Yes. Ms. Meyer? Yes. Mr. Purdue? Yes. Ms. Tallman? Yes. Ms. Warner? Yes. Motion carries 5 0. 
Next item 3C is vote to elect the president. When you call your <laughs> vote, please name the individual that you would like to be president. Roll call. Ms. Bennis. Beth Warnery. Ms. Menner. Beth Warnery. Mr. Purdue. Beth Warnery. Ms. Thomas. Beth Warnery. Ms. Warnery. Beth Warnery. Okay, 5 0. Beth Warnery. Now I need a motion to close the vote. A motion and a second. I make a motion to close the voting for president. I'll second. Okay, I have a motion by Beth, a second by Crystal to close the voting. Roll call, please. Ms. Bemis? Yes. Ms. Menner? Yes. Mr. Purdue? Yes. Ms. Thomas? Yes. Ms. Warnery? Yes. Motion carries 5 0. Next is the oath of office to the new 2022 elected president. Okay, Ms. Warnery, do you solemnly swear that you will support the Constitution of the United States? and the Constitution of the state of Ohio, and that you will faithfully and impartially discharge your duties as members of the Board of Education of the Reading Community City School District, Hamilton County, Ohio, to the best of your ability, in accordance with the laws now in effect and hereafter to be enacted during your continuance in said office and until your successor is elected and qualified. I will. Thank you. And I duly and faithfully turn the rest of the meetings over to you. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Purdue. Resolution 04-22, election of vice president. I need a motion to open the nominations. I'll make the motion to open the nominations. I'll second. Motion by Mr. Purdue, second by Mrs. Mena. Roll call, please. Ms. Bennett? Yes. Ms. Mena? Yes. Mr. Purdue? Yes. Ms. Thomas? Yes. Ms. Yes. Okay, and any nominations for vice president? I'll nominate Alicia Emmons. Okay, any other motion or any other nominations for vice president? Seeing there are none, we need a motion to close nominations. I'll make a motion to close nominations. I'll second. Motion by Mrs. Tomlin, second by Mrs. Menner. Roll call, please. Ms. Bennett? Yes. Ms. Menner? Yes. Mr. Purdue? Yes. Ms. Tomlin? Yes. Ms. Warner? Yes. Vote to elect vice president. And again, when roll call is taken, please say, state the person's name. Ms. Bemis. Alicia Bemis. Ms. Menner. Alicia Bemis. Mr. Purdue. Alicia Bemis. Ms. Thomas. Alicia Bemis. Ms. Warnery. Alicia Bemis. Okay, move to close votes. Need a motion, please. I'll make a motion if we close the votes. I'll second. Motion by Mr. Purdue, second by Mrs. Menner to close the voting. Roll call, please. Ms. Bennett? Yes. Ms. Meyer? Yes. Mr. Purdue? Yes. Ms. Thomas? Yes. Ms. Yes. Okay. And if you'll please stand for the other office. All right. Ms. Bennett, do you solemnly swear that you will support the Constitution of the United States and the Constitution of the State of Ohio, and that you will faithfully and impartially discharge your duties as members of the Board of Education of the Reading Community City School District, Hamilton County, Ohio, to the best of your ability? and in accordance with the laws now in effect and hereafter to be enacted during your continuance in said office and until your successor is elected and qualified. I do. Okay. Resolution 05-22, establish regular meeting date, time and place for the 2022 board meetings. And that is in your packet. They again will be on the first and the third Wednesdays at 530 in the media center. Um, the only um, one is there's a note that in December there will only be one meeting. Okay. Need a motion, please. I'll make the motion that we approve the um, board meeting list as written. I'll second. Motion by Mr. Purdue, second by Mrs. Bemis. Roll call, please. Ms. Bemis? Yes. Ms. Meyer? Yes. Mr. Purdue? Yes. Ms. Thomas? Yes. Ms. Warnery? Yes. yes. Resolution 0622 establish service fund for the board for an amount not to exceed $20,000. I need a motion, please. I'll make a motion. I'll second. Motion by Mr. Purdue, second by Mrs. Bemis. Roll call, please. Ms. Bemis? Yes. Ms. Menner? Yes. Mr. Purdue? Yes. Ms. Thomas? Yes. Ms. Warnery? Yes. Treasurer's report and uh, budget hearing overview. 
Mrs. So Lewis? earlier this evening at five o'clock, we held the tax budget hearing. Um, and just in brief, what this allows us to do or that Hamilton County uh, is to convert our fiscal year revenue to a calendar year. And that allows the county to set tax rates, raise, excuse me, tax rates and it validates revenue and expenses um, outside of the five year forecast. So it kind of aligns for them. Um, every school district in the state of Ohio is doing this. And by law, each board of education has to approve a tax budget um, by January 20th. So the tax, the tax budget is at your seat. Uh, the next item on the agenda is to actually approve that. So that tax budget meeting was held this afternoon at five. Okay, thank you. New business resolution 7-22, approved tax budget for fiscal year 2022. Motion, please. I'll make the motion. I'll second. Motion by Mr. Perdue, second by Mrs. Bemis. Any discussion, questions? Okay, roll call, please. Ms. Bemis? Yes. Ms. Manner? Yes. Mr. Yes. Ms. Common? Yes. Ms. Yes. Recommend the approval of the following resolutions, which will commence and remain in effect from 1 6 22 through 1 15 23. Resolution 08 22 authorize the treasurer to purchase liability insurance for board members. Do these need to be voted on separately? Okay. Get a motion, please. I'll make a motion for resolution uh, 08 22. I'll second. Motion by Mr. Bemis, or <laughs> Mr. Purdue, second by Mrs. Bemis. I'm sorry. I'm <laughs> sorry. Uh, I've already well, messed up for the ascending. year. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Roll call, please. Ms. Bemis? Yes. Ms. Munner? Yes. Mr. Purdue? Yes. Ms. Hallman? Yes. Ms. Yes. Resolution 09-22, authorize the treasurer to secure performance bonds for the superintendent, treasurer, and board president. Now I need a motion, please. I'll make the motion. I'll second. Motion by Mrs. Bemis, second by Mrs. Menner. Roll call, please. Question? Sure. Um, do we wait until she comes on board to do this for her or? No, nope, because it's um, generalized. Do I the treasure? doesn't matter. Okay. Correct. Yep. Thank you. Absolutely. Roll call. So we're Ms. Bemis? Yes. Ms. Menner? Yes. Mr. Purdue? Yes. Ms. Tallman? Yes. Ms. Warner? Yes. Okay, moving on to appointments. Resolution 10-22, appoint the treasurer as representative to the Hamilton County Tax Incentive Review Council. I need a motion, please. I'll make the motion. Second. Motion by Mr. Purdue, second by Mrs. Tallman. Roll call, please. Ms. Bemis? Yes. Ms. Menner? Yes. Ms. Purdue? Yes. Ms. Tallman? Yes. Ms. Warner? Yes. Ms. yes. Resolution 11-22, appoint the treasurer as public records officer. Need a motion, please. I'll make the motion. I'll second. Motion by Mrs. Bemis, second by Mrs. Menner. Roll call, please. Ms. Bemis? Yes. Ms. Menner? Yes. Mr. Perdue? Yes. Ms. Tallman? Yes. Ms. Warnery? Yes. Resolution 12-22, appoint committee members. Finance committee is uh, Mr. Purdue and Mrs. Tommen, Buildings and Grounds, Mrs. Bemis and Mrs. Menner. Policy Committee is Mr. Purdue and myself. And we have a new um, committee that is formed this year called the City and School Relations that we'll be working closely with the city. Uh, we're really excited about doing this. And the chairperson is Mrs. Menner and I will also be sitting on that committee. Need a motion, please. I'll make the motion. We appoint the the noted committee members. I'll, I'll second. second. I'll motion by Mrs. Bemis, second by Mrs. Menner. Any questions? Roll call. Ms. Bemis? Yes. Ms. Menner? Yes. Mr. Purdue? Yes. Ms. Tomlin? Yes. Ms. Yes. Resolution 13-22, appoint board members, effective 1-6-22 through 1-15-23, to serve on the following. Legislative liaison to OSBA and student achievement liaison to OSBA. The legislative liaison is Mrs. Bemis. Student achievement, achievement liaison is Mrs. Tommen. And need a motion, please. I'll make the motion. I'll second. Motion by Mr. Purdue, second by Mrs. Warnery. Roll call, please. 
Ms. Bemis? Yes. Ms. Menner? Yes. Ms. Perdue? Yes. Ms. Tallman? Yes. Ms. Warner? Yes. Resolution 14-22, appoint treasurer and superintendent effective 1622 through 11523 as corporate officers of the district and authorizing each to execute documents on behalf of the district. I need a motion, please. I'll make the motion. I'll second. Motion by Mr. Perdue, second by Mrs. Bemis. Roll call, please. Can we have a discussion here real quick? Yes. So um, this is an item that we will be reapproving on January 19th with um, Mrs. Burke as the authorized signer effective February 1st. But in the meantime, this I will still be the authorized signer with Mr. Enix. Okay. But we will be reapproving this one. Okay. I was going to ask that question. And I thought, nope, probably not. Probably I'm reading something. your mind, Dan. <laughs> That's a bad situation. <laughs> Roll call, please. Ms. Bemis? Yes. Ms. Menner? Yes. Mr. Perdue? Yes. Ms. Tallman? Yes. Ms. Yes. Recommend the approval of the following board resolutions, which will commence and remain in effect from 1622 through 11523. Number one, resolution 15 22, resolution authorizing the superintendent to employ temporary personnel as needed, subject to vote of ratification by the board. I'll make the motion. I'll second. Motion by Mr. Perdue, second by Mrs. Menner. Roll call, please. Mrs. Bemis? Yes. Mrs. Menner? Yes. Mr. Perdue? Yes. Mrs. Tomlin? Yes. Mrs. Warnery? Yes. yes. Resolution 16-22, resolution authorizing the superintendent to serve as the board's designee hearing officer for the purpose of hearing suspension or expulsion appeals, unless the suspension or expulsion is issued by the superintendent, at which time the district's attorney will serve as the hearing officer. Need a motion, please. I'll make the motion. Second. Motion by Mrs. Manor, second by Mr. Perdue. Roll call, please. Ms. Bemis? Yes. Ms. Manor? Yes. Mr. Perdue? Yes. Ms. Tomlin? Yes. Ms. Warnery? Yes. Resolution 17 22, resolution authorizing the superintendent to accept resignations, which have been submitted by employees during the times when this board is not in session, subject to ratification by this board. Provided, however, that upon ratification by this board, such resignations shall be deemed effective as of the date and time of the superintendent's acceptance. Any motion, please. I'll make the motion. I'll second. second. Motion yes. by Mrs. Bemis, second by Mrs. Menor. Roll call, please. Ms. Bemis? Yes. Ms. Meyer? Yes. Mr. Yes. Ms. Yes. Ms. Warnery? Yes. Resolution 18-22, resolution authorizing superintendent to hire staff during times when this board is not in session, subject to ratification by this board, provided, however, that upon ratification by this board, such hiring shall be deemed effective as of the date and time of the superintendent's acceptance. I need a motion, please. I'll make the motion. I'll second. Motion by Mrs. Bemis, second by Mrs. Tommen. Roll call, please. Ms. Bemis. Yes. Ms. Yes. Mr. Yes. Ms. Tallman? Yes. Ms. Yes. Resolution 19-22. I need a motion to adjourn. I'll make a motion. I'll second. Motion by Mr. Purdue, second by Mrs. Menor to adjourn the organizational meeting. All, All in favor? Aye. 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 So time. Time is 550. Okay. Who was the second on uh, resolution 1422? Uh, thank you. Okay. <laughs> All right, call this meeting to order. Roll call, please. Ms. Bennett. Here. Ms. Menner. Here. Mr. Here. Ms. Here. Ms. Warner. Here. And I have 551. Pledge of Allegiance. If stand for the pledge, please. I pledge allegiance Legions to the flag, flag of the United, United States, States of America, America and, and to the republic, republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Resolution 20-22, approval of the agenda. Need a um, move. I'll second. Motion by Mrs. Wernery, second by Mr. Purdue. Roll call, please. Ms. Bemis? Yes. Ms. Manor? Yes. Ms. Warnery? Yes. Mr. Purdue? Yes. Ms. Tomlin? Yes. Ms
Yes. 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 I'd like to welcome get viewers and guests. Uh, those of you who are watching now or watching at a more convenient time for, for you. Um, this meeting is a meeting of the Board of Education in public for the purpose of conducting the school district's business and is not to be considered a public community meeting. There's a time for public participation during this meeting as indicated in the agenda. Okay, seeing that there's no one here for public participation, the presentations will move right into board committee updates. Buildings and grounds. I don't know if I'm muted or not. Um, I don't have any updates at this time. Okay, thank you. Finance? Don't have anything, but uh, our next uh, scheduled board meeting is 5-18, May 18th. And there could be a special one thrown in there if need be. Okay, thank you. Policy, nothing at this time. And then our new, brand new, City School Relations. Okay. And um, with the committee updates, if we could possibly, because they are board committees, um, any scheduled times or things that we can get on the calendar, um, whenever you get those figured out in your committees, if you'll just let us know. Or let Mrs. Lewis know and she can put that on the Okay, uh, moving on to district report. Mr. Enix. Thank you, Ms. Warnery. I have a brief presentation to share uh, with the board tonight, as well as those uh, that are uh, watching from home. I'm showing my screen right now, so we'll just hold on momentarily. Flip to the slideshow. So tonight, um, there's really a couple of items to share with you. The first is the district COVID-19 uh, report and update on isolation and quarantine guidance. Uh, this has been a very hot topic over the last couple of weeks, in particular during the holiday break, as the CDC has made some changes to the guidance in which the Ohio Department of Health has adopted. I'd like to share that with the board tonight in a very brief way of really what's new and how we are operating as we are now in really day three of, of working in, in those new guidelines. Uh, that have been approved by the Ohio Department of Health. Um, again, this was released um, back in December. This really should say December 30th. I apologize for the, the typo. Uh, and it does adopt the new CDC recommendations. Really what's new here is that those, to, those that are a confirmed case of COVID-19 shortens the isolation period uh, from the 10 days that uh, were the previous guidelines to the five days from that positive test. That is a really significant change, uh, which allows uh, everyone to kind of re-enter back into uh, school work and community life in a quicker way, presuming that of course people are, are feeling better, their symptoms are improving, no fever and those kind of things. We were able to get uh, students back into school sooner. It does still require uh, a mask to be worn for that 10 day period, but coming back into uh, school does happen a little bit quicker. Currently, there is no requirement to test on day five. That's been another hot topic um, and is not part of the guidance provided by the Ohio Department of Health. Uh, you'll see an asterisk there only because the CDC modified the guidance yesterday with some language that was really stating more so if you have access to a test and would choose to do so, it would really be good practice to do a test on day five and making sure that, the, that um, we're, you're no longer considered to be positive at that point. Um, but that is, again, not a requirement and not something that we are utilizing here in the district. What's also been updated is the state's K-12 mass to stay test to play protocol. You'll recall that we, uh, back in October, this was approved by the Ohio Department of Health and moved forward uh, in, in our district as well. And it continues to this to this day with some updated uh, information or updated guidance uh, based upon what has been uh, recommended by the CDC. Um, again, I think it's really important to, to recognize that this applies to close contacts of a positive case in a classroom environment, meaning here at school. Uh, this is again, separate from what would be considered a community um, uh, close contact. But mass to say, um, some of the changes here really are, are stating that regardless of masking or vaccination status, that a student would be able to remain in school if they wear a mask for 10 days, monitor for symptoms, 
and then of course isolate and test if they do experience symptoms. And of course they would start that isolation protocol if positive. The test to play components for those that are involved in extracurricular activities, as long as they are asymptomatic, they can continue to participate in their, their activity as long as they're wearing a mask whenever possible, including of course um, on bus rides and locker rooms and those kinds of locations. Uh, testing on initial exposure and testing on day five is recommended. The asterisk there is, does state that in this guidance, the test must be a PCR antigen test and it has to be proctored or observed by a professional. Uh, may not be an over-the-counter at-home test that's self-administered without a proctor. So that is part of the uh, requirements to, to continue into that protocol. If a decision is made not to do either of those two things, then of course they would go back to the standard isolation and un unable to participate in extracurricular activities. So it's slight, slight modifications based on new guidance, but these uh, NASA stay test to play do uh, continue as, uh, as previously. And again, a reminder, it is K-12. Uh, we are a PK-12 building. So it's just important to note that these are not, um, these, these standards do not apply to the preschool environment. This is a, a revert back to some previous graphics that have been shared for quite some time. I, I add this back into the presentation only just to note that the graphs from the Hamilton County Public Health uh, do show a, a pretty significant rise and spike in the latest COVID data or positive data in both Hamilton County, which is the one on the top, and the one on the bottom is for the zip code 45215. So this is the longitudinal data dating back to the beginning of the pandemic, uh, the peak that was seen really back in um, December of last year, December and January, the second peak back in the summer, um, or just after the summer, and then of course here we are today, uh, which has significantly risen in both the county and in our zip code, and as well as throughout the state and the country as well. Can you remind me the gray? Lighter. Yeah, the, the, if this was a live graph, and if you're on the Hamilton County Public Health's website, you would see that this is a live scroll over graph. And if you were to scroll over the gray, you would note that those are specific dates in which those tests happen. The orange line is the uh, moving seven day average. And that's where you see again, the, the compilation of, of both uh, or all of those days combined in that average. This is our most recent um, COVID-19 report from the district. We are still required to uh, record and report our district numbers. Uh, we did have a, a lapse from the last time this was posted on December 15th, as during the holiday break, we did not have any active monitoring of cases during that time. So this really is a start over, uh, really from that two week time period off, anything would have really cleared out of the, out of the reporting process and we picked back up starting on Monday and really kind of playing a little bit of catch up from uh, those that uh, we're calling in and, and we have students uh, who are, are not with us. So um, this is again dated today's report as of late this afternoon. So it is up to date as of the end of our school day today. Uh, we are currently in the district with five staff members who are COVID positive at this time. We have 27 confirmed cases across both buildings uh, of students and 60 of those students are in quarantine, which is a big number. However, it would be more than double that if we weren't in the mass stay protocol. At the very bottom in very tiny numbers, you'll know that it says, does, it does say mass stay is at 62. So we have effectively then you know, 122 that would be considered close contacts. Um, many of those uh, that are community at home, uh, close contacts as well, but uh, this is our total number of, of reportable students that are positive, uh, close contacts, uh, quarantines, and of course, staff related as well. Currently, and I, you'll see down here at the bottom, we have three of our athletic teams that are, that are in the test to play protocol as they have been close contacts of a positive case within the, within those teams. So again, able to continue. If you'll recall this time last year, we didn't have these protocols to follow. So if a, if a team was a close contact, it really meant that we had to put the team on pause for, for quite a long period of time. Um, that is not the case now, but it does require some extra steps along the way with testing upon notification of being a close contact and that day five is recommended before uh, as part of the test to play protocol. I have a question about the test to play. Considering it takes so long to get in for a test now, um, 
and then there's no at-home tests available, even the proctored ones. Like, does that mean, like, I, I know it was like an asterisk or something in there. Does that mean that they just really can't participate in the test to play or they can continue? Or? They can continue as long as they're asymptomatic, okay. no, no okay. symptoms, they test upon notification. And I know sometimes it does take a little bit of time to get that back, yeah. but as long as they uh, go into the test to play protocol, they are permitted to continue. Okay. And then also we have um, tests, I believe. Do we, are we utilizing the the Binax? We do not currently have any tests that are not outdated. Oh, man. Okay. Not at this time. That would have been a hot commodity <laughs> right now. <laughs> this is a, a new uh, set of information, and I think it's important to kind of share with all of you as board members and, and for, for those that are watching at home really the impacts that are happening in real time in terms of the staffing and substitute shortage um, that is, is happening for school districts all around the area, really throughout the country. Um, you might recall back in the, you know, throughout the, the first part of the school year, we talked about the sub shortage that was a pretty significant issue. Um, what's really ramped this up right now is not only is there a sub shortage, but the number of staff that are, are out of school as a result of either self um, you know, self sickness, you know, with COVID or taking care of loved ones, whatever the case may be. This is some data that came out this, just late this afternoon, really doing a comparison between January of 2019 and 2020 with average number of vacancies that were filled and average number of vacancies that were unfilled um, in, in comparison to where we are in the first couple of days back of school this year. So if you'll notice on the, on the across the graph, um, the first the first column uh, is a comparison between 2019 and 2020, again, with, with the average filled vacancies. That means that a staff member, a, a teacher is out. This is for certified staff members uh, that are out of their classroom on those days. Um, between 750 and 800 was, would be average that were filled, meaning that a substitute was able to go into that classroom. Right now, uh, in the, on the, the first couple of days back, uh, that would be, well, the data is from Tuesday and Wednesday, so yesterday and today. The average number is 690. So those seem to be uh, somewhat in alignment. What makes this really different is the second column. January of 2019 and 2020, the average number of vacancies that were unfilled, meaning that a teacher was out of the classroom and there wasn't a substitute to cover, was between 100 and 150. On the first two days of this data, the average unfilled vacancies across the area was 520. Now, this data is from Subsolutions, which is a provider through the Hamilton County ESC for many, many districts across the area. And this is uh, where, where we utilize our, our subcalling system as well. So um, it is a very significant concern about the number of unfilled vacancies that are happening really all across the area. Um, you'll notice here, too, that the less than 24-hour notice, and really what that means is, you know, if you have kind of a sudden onset of sickness or not feeling well or a child maybe that needs taken care of, that's typically where you have a less than 24 hour notice of a, of a need for a substitute. Um, back in 2019 and 2020, approximately 200 of those happened on, on a regular basis. The first two days of this data were at 300, um, again, across the region. The last item on here just states that the average daily substitute request, the comparison between then and now is 900 to over 1200. So the, the number of, of staff that are missing from school because of a of, uh, number of different reasons, but including for COVID, uh, is certainly having an impact on um, the substitute teaching around the area and the sub shortage means we have many more unfilled vacancies uh, than we used to in the past. Underneath that, you'll see what our current uh, first three days back to school looks like. Uh, we've had six filled vacancies each day. Um, we've had an increase in the number of unfilled vacancies uh, each of these three days. We had six today that had to be either covered by uh, teachers on their plan period at the secondary level or by a number of different ways at the elementary level, which includes sometimes splitting classrooms or, or coverage in various different ways. So uh, it, is a, it is a concern um, that has certainly uh, been anticipated, but, and it's frankly, it's a concern we've had throughout most of the school year but it is very clearly a, a concern right now as we come back to school, um, really in, in what was very different circumstances than we were in back in, in the middle of December. Jason, on, on these numbers, it, <clears throat> I see that the source is the comprehensive uh, substitute solution. Uh, 
-hmm. Hamilton yeah. County ESC, yeah. is that, are these numbers just from Hamilton County? This is just from the these comprehensive sub-solutions that is run out of Hamilton County ESC. It's a regional substitute filling cog. Okay. Yeah, then I would, when I, when I looked at the numbers, that, that to me is crazy if that is just Hamilton County. And it says local and regional, which means it's outside of Hamilton County, which would make a lot more sense with these numbers. Well, local was really our own district. That was that was what I was referencing with local. And this comes from the Hamilton County ESC, which is primarily Hamilton County. And my belief is they do go outside of Hamilton County to a certain level, but it is in our area. This is, these are the numbers that we're seeing. This is not a statewide system. Right? But this is some, these are districts that partner with sub-solutions through the Hamilton County ESC okay. for all of this. When I saw the local and regional, it was like, those, those are... I understand, I understand that there's there. a lot of issues, but those are pretty high numbers. They are very high numbers. Well, I'm say regional. It's, it's literally numbers. Like, they are, yeah. it, it's just like right into Butler County or right into like one. It's not, it's, it's not that much further. Away. We're not talking about the southwest quadrant of Ohio. We're talking about this this confined area. Okay. Thank you. So I wanted just to to, uh, to share with everyone kind of what we're seeing here as we start back to school. I know it's been uh, in the media cycle, um, you know, every single day as we've come back to school. So I felt like it was important to share what where we are with, with some of that data uh, with the board and with our public tonight. This uh, last slide from for this evening is uh, community conversations. Um, wanted to get the most up-to-date opportunities to interact with, um, you know, superintendent and treasurer uh, with some facilitated community meetings as has been requested or, or preferred through survey. A lot of these are going to be in the evenings and there'll be a combination of in-person as well as through uh, through Zoom. And then off, we have added some additional opportunities that might be in the mornings or at, around the lunchtime hour as well. So uh, most of these are uh, really heavily on the district financial future, but a number of other items are on here as well as far as some lunch and learn opportunities for just general conversation around our district. I do wanna highlight Wednesday, January 12th, um, Mr. Ferguson, our principal at Reading Junior Senior High School, is hosting a parent information session in the Media Center on a number of different topics that are, are really pertinent and relevant for families uh, related to our junior and senior high school students. So, if, um, again, those that are interested in attending, I think it'll be a very important informational session to, to attend. But that is uh, a little bit different than the rest of, of these that are on here that will be facilitated by, by Mr. Ferguson. That is the end of our district report for tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions? Any other questions? Okay, moving on to new business. Resolution 21-22, recommend the approving, recommend approving the resolution, determining the proceed to proceed to levy an additional tax for current operating expenses for May 2022. Any motion, please. I'll make the motion. I'll second. Motion by Mr. Purdue, second by Mrs. Demis. Any further discussion? Okay. Uh, just very briefly, um, prior to this resolution, I just wanted to uh, remind the board and for those that are, are watching that this is um, coming off of a resolution of necessity that was approved back in December at the recommendation of the Finance Committee. Uh, this is 9.99 .99 mil uh, operating levy for uh, general operating expenses. It's um, really important to also remember, too, that the recommendation does include reductions uh, if the levy is not successful as a result of what the five-year forecast is stating uh, as to the future of what our, our finances are in the district. So what we'd like to propose is that after tonight, uh, and if this is to a resolution to proceed, move forward, that we'd like to bring to the board on January 19th a, a broad overview of what those reductions might look like, including the, the dollar amount and scope of what we'd be looking at if the levy were not to be successful to be implemented into the 22 and 23 school year. So over the next couple of weeks, we're we'll working with our administrative team to identify those and would like to plan to bring that to the board uh, for discussion on January 19th. Roll call, please. Ms. Thomas? Yes. Ms. Munner? Yes. 
Mr. Perdue? Yes. Ms. Thomas? Yes. Ms. Warner? Yes. Resolution 22-22, recommend the approval of Megan Overbeck as home instructor at $30 per hour, not to exceed five hours per week, effective December 1, 2021 through February 1, 2022. Any motion, please? I'll make the motion. I'll second. Okay. Motion by Mrs. Bemis, second by Mrs. Meadow. Roll call, please. Ms. Bemis? Yes. Ms. Meyer? Yes. Mr. Yes. Ms. Tomlin? Yes. Ms. Warnery? Yes. Okay, moving into our board development. I'd like to welcome Aaron Wessendorf Wortman to join our meeting this evening and has some some updated information, some reminders, some board development. Sorry. So, do's do's and don'ts. Awesome. Do's and don'ts. So I now I sent an email um, prior to this meeting. Our printers at the office are not quite working yet because we got new ones over break, so that's exciting. Um, but I did send a PowerPoint presentation. I know it is long. I'm not going to read over all of it because it's 70 some slides. Thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> um, I figured y'all would not want 70 slides of me talking, but did want to at least talk a little, a little bit about some of the things as reminders going into the year. And I'm just going to open mine too, if that's okay. Um, hey, thanks. Can you can real quick. Nope. Yeah. I own this one as well. Okay, perfect. <laughs> so at least you know our fancy new Anna's Britain brand. Okay. Um, at least knowing public record sunshine laws and levy rules. Um, the beginning part just with regard to school board and authority for your reminders. And I'm going to click through it because you all know it. And if you want to have a reminder, that's a good part of it. I will come back to at least this part of acting together as board members. And I'll talk about it in some pieces with sunshine laws and public records and with regard to a little bit of levy campaign do's and don'ts. Imagine we're having a levy. This is spring. Good luck, Dusty. Um, don't forget that you can only act together as a board. Your individual actions by themselves, the conversations you have in public and on social media are not board actions. However, the perception of the public over those comments that you make on those things can very well sometimes control the narrative. While it might not be illegal, it can very well have the perception that it is the board speaking and not one board member, simply because you are the board president or the board vice president, right? And so just remember that when you're on social media, when you're in public, if you're at a levy committee meeting, the fact that you are speaking, how are you there, you need to be careful about, okay? So I'd just like to point that out. And I do have your board policy on there as well, just in case you wanted a reminder for that. Um, public records. Y'all, in this past year, um, I have not seen as many public records requests as I have in the decade plus that I've been receiving. And a lot of times it's, we have some that are going across the state. We have some that are just trying to hit school districts in Hamilton County, whether it is on your expenditure of ESSER dollars, whether it's on CRT or masking or your state of play or vaccines or what are you communicating, all the things, right? All the things, public records requests are coming. So you all need to be very aware that as a board member, what you do can be seen as a public record, depending on how you're communicating, the intent of your communicating and where you communicate it. Okay? So just as at least a quick reminder on that, Public records, so kept by a public office or a person responsible for records. Person responsible for records, select for now. And then your new treasurer, Jen, right? Jen coming in. And so they are the people responsible. However, as board members, you're also responsible for your own records. So if you conduct public business on your personal email, you shouldn't be doing that, A. But B, it can still be a public record, even though it's on your personal email. So you're responsible for keeping that in accordance with your records retention schedule adopted by the board. That is true for text messages, social media, back and forth, anything. Correct, not just personal email, your personal cell phones, if you're conducting board business. Now, in those moments when that will happen, if you get a records request for something like that, I would work with your treasurer, your treasurer talk to me, you and I would sit down to determine whether or not we, we think what you have is public business because that would be a good conversation for your legal counsel 
I need to have to determine, hey, do we find this to be public business or not, no matter where it's kept. Don't think that if you delete it off your cell phone, it can't ever be obtained. I've had school districts go about um, hiring companies to copy all of the data off your personal cell phones so that we can search it. Now, granted, it's for litigation, but it can still happen in public record cases too. So just know, don't delete it. Don't try to hide it in a Facebook messaging, an Instagram messaging, um, a WhatsApp, um, any of the things. All right. I'm also happy to take questions as we talk in case you're like, what about this? I'm asking for a friend. And I know it's in a public meeting. <laughs> um, do know though, public records are anything that you create. So photos, text messages, emails, records of conversation. If you have a conversation, but there's no record of it, not a public record. You don't have to create something in response to a records request. Okay? But it has to serve the document, the organization, function, business policies, decisions, procedures, et cetera, of Reading schools. So if, um, let's say, Beth and Collab were to have a conversation, hey, where are we going to lunch today? Great, we're going to lunch. Good for you. That does not serve to document the business functions, organizations, policies of Reading schools. That is not a public record. Okay? But if, for whatever reason, you have, let's say, staff members always can going to lunch or always doing things on their email that are personal in nature and we now discipline a staff member for that and we use those emails and that discipline, that's now a public record. Even though them communicating with other staff members might not in and of itself be a public record if it's about, let's say, their kids or their upcoming wedding or Disney plans or whatever else. Okay. Even if that's part of the disciplinary? If it is part of disciplinary, it would be a public record. But the email of itself, Right, so let's say a couple of staff members are emailing constantly during the school day, not just during plan. If we don't discipline them, those records, not a public record. Okay. Because they're not documenting the business functions, organizations, decisions of writing schools. But when we find out about it, hey, you should be teaching right now, right? You're not teaching. Here are the emails that show you're not teaching during lesson time. We are disciplining you because of that. Now it's a public record because we're using that in the district's business. Okay. Um, you all are public offices, you all are public officers, so don't forget that. Certain things are not public records, but I will tell you if you're ever responding to a records request, you're gonna talk to legal counsel to determine if something is not. If you can redact it from the file, you cannot provide it. <laughs> personal notes are a really big one um, that we see a lot of times. Board members will take personal notes, administrators will. Personal notes are personal notes until you share them. So if you have a board notebook and you share it at home or you don't keep it locked up at home in a place that other people can't obtain, it could be a public record. And I can't tell you that it wouldn't ever be subpoenaed in court. So just because it's not a public record doesn't mean that it couldn't be used in court if needed. So sometimes we keep a personal notebook, which is great, and we'll never keep it for ourselves to so not a public record. But then we get a subpoena for it have to turn it over. That same exception doesn't apply to a subpoena. Okay. Um, we did talk about email, so I'm not going to go into that. Private email accounts, already talked about that. Other electronic communications, I'm not going to pick on um, Cincinnati City Council, but I will. Anything you do on your cell phones, don't forget, can be a public record. Do you remember about a year or two ago? I don't even know if it was that. It was the gang of six or whatever from the city of Cincinnati. Mm -hmm. They got in big trouble for their text messages turn it over to court. A lot of those conversations, not public record, but because they thought about turning them over and they were doing a lot of weird conversations on text message, a judge reviewed it and then called them out for all of the games and shit. So just make sure that when in doubt, call someone. It's your best bet. Old school, I don't like to do it very much anymore. I like email and text message, but call people. It's a great idea because the phone call is not a public record because it's a verbal conversation. Okay. Talked about text messages, and this is just a supporting Ohio case law on that. There are certain other exceptions. Attorney client privilege is a big one um, that we sit with, student records, social security numbers. All of these things are what we review the records for, see if we don't have to provide them. Do you have questions on public records? I know that a lot of them should go to your treasurer. 
just remind your administrators that, that all of those need to go to the treasurer. We can have a lot of anonymous ones, so don't forget that. Um, as a treasurer also, I believe the auditor require, requires you, though it's not a legal requirement, to keep a list of the records requests that come in, the date you received it, the date you respond, and what your response was. So that's also in there. What um, would you, I have a question. Yes, ma'am. What would you say is best practice? Would you say to, um, I guess, request that people contact you only on your school email or then just avoid texting and any other forms of communication? Okay. Correct. Because I've seen what happens in these cases. Um, I don't believe we've met. I'm Erin. No. Hi, I'm Amy. <laughs> <laughs> um, in these cases, what tends to happen is we, we're responding on text messages or Facebook direct message. And all of a sudden, you have these conversations with people, but it's, are, is it as a board member? Is it not? Where does the line get crossed? Mm -hmm. They're coming to you with their concerns, but they don't want you to report. It all gets very messy very quickly. Mm -hmm. And so in those elements, it's, it's really important to say, hey, let's please put it to my Reading School Board email okay. if it's about Reading School Business, because okay. otherwise it can get icky. And, mm -hmm. and that's a really good legal term, I know. But... <laughs> I've seen it where even the individuals who are complaining to you, if they don't start to get their way, I know attorneys don't ever come with sunshine and have a bad story of us. We come with bad, <laughs> cynical cases. Mm -hmm. They can turn on board members and mm -hmm. say, well, give me all the records where people were complaining to you. And right. now I want your text messages. I want your Facebook posts. Mm -hmm. And then you have to sit down with me and we have to go through those things. And I don't like that. It, it's not good, right? It's, okay. it's not where I like to be. Yeah. So. Push it to Reading email, and I think you'll be in a much better spot. Okay, great. Yeah. Thanks. You're welcome. Um, talked about that process and rights for records requests. This is all within Colette's bailiwick. She gets the records request. She has to respond. We have to either respond through providing the records or denying. And the denial can look like redactions, but we do have to respond. They can be anonymous. Um, we aren't required to require their identity unless they're looking for student information. Um, can be inspection of copies or can be hard copy, can be electronic copies. I would say um, if you all have not reviewed your records retention policy any time in the last three years, most people haven't done it in 10, I recommend that you review your records retention schedule because we can move things more quickly that you are already destroying and getting rid of, it's just not necessarily in alignment with your records retention policy. Okay, to say that text messages have transient value, and so we can move them much more quickly. Um, we did the special note on emails and texts. You can tell that I have a lot of cases just on text messages. Um, private property, I don't care whether it's on your personal cell phone or laptop. If it's conducting public business and you did it, then it's a public record. Put questions on those. I was given about a half hour, so I got 15 minutes for talk, not even, 10 minutes for talk. <laughs> My attorney man. Board meetings, y'all are having so much fun. Your organizational meeting is quick. It's awesome. That's what you did this morning was your organizational meeting, but or this morning, earlier this evening. <laughs> Basic rule on Ohio Sunshine Law, you're a public body, you have to meet in public. That's why a lot of the cases in Cincinnati City Council were getting in trouble is because we were conducting things outside of the public. So when in doubt, we're always in the public. So committee meetings, when in doubt, if it's not a board committee, it, Board committee must be in public. If it's a question, we're going to make it public just for pure ease of making sure you're legal. I'd rather you err on the side of having it in public. You are a public body, including your board and your committees, if necessary. Um, factors that can be looked at is necessarily the business of what's being conducted by those committees. But for any meetings, pre-arranged gathering of the majority of the members of your body. So three of you present somewhere. If you are present and discussing public business, it is a meeting, and I would suggest that you have done notice, you are following the sunshine laws. If you are merely present and receiving information, it's not a public meeting, okay? Because you are simply a recipient, but that also means that you have to trust yourself in showing up to those meetings to not talk. So no deliberation, no discussion, not even, well, we'll just position ourselves in separate parts of the room and we'll all talk random. That's not gonna work. You can't have those <laughs> moments, right? So just know that if two of you are going to be there, I'm fine. But when you start becoming more, 
It better be informational only or it's a public meeting. Okay? Do be aware of conducting the meetings by email. I know sometimes we will have administrators who send you all emails and we wanna respond. A thank you does not bother me. A response with a clarifying question bothers me when it now goes to all five of you and now we have a back and forth response. So if you receive email communications from your administrators or your legal counsel, and it looks like we blind copied you all, we have done that for a reason, to protect you all from yourselves, to be very honest, okay? Because it prevents you from doing the reply all and inadvertently having a public meeting without meeting to. Okay? Any questions on that? So if we send emoji back with a mask, we're good. <laughs> yes, I like emojis back. That makes me chuckle. Um, openness requirement. The other piece is at this. Is just remember, your openness is only to have people come and listen. There is no legal requirement to the public participation in the board meeting. If you open it and you have it, which you all do, right? We sometimes temporarily suspended it due to COVID during some of that time. But once you open public participation, you have to have it. And there's certain rules based on First Amendment right, freedom of speech, and the limited public forum that you created that you have to allow people to speak. But you don't have to if you ever decide, hey, I'm not, we as a board don't think we want that anymore. People can email us, they can call us, they can whatever else to talk to the board. Um, you do have the requirement to have your minutes um, be available for public inspection. Um, there are ways to enforce Open Meetings Act. People are going after them again. So open meetings violations are um, being popular, being filed again in the courts, which for a few years we hadn't. And this can look like monetary um, amounts, not really to the people who file, but to the attorneys, to be honest, because the penalty is only $500 a violation to the individual who's filing, but attorney's fees start to pile up pretty quickly for the uh, plaintiff's counsel. Just on that, just so you know, you had your organizational meeting, regular and special, you have to have a regular at least every two months, just in case you all decide to miss some in November or December, which can happen with the holidays. And special meetings are at least 48 hours prior to the meeting date and have to specify what you're doing at that meeting um, pretty clearly. Otherwise we can have a meeting be stated as invalid. Um, executive session, your treasurers will always know this. You can go into executive session without the public being present for only certain limited reasons, one of those six. And that's it. And you have to state it with specificity. You can't just say, oh, for any of the reasons in here, you have to pick one. And for the employment personnel matters, you should be picking one of those items or two or three or however many apply, but not all of them. Okay. Um, discussion versus deliberation. Don't forget in executive session, you can talk all you want, but we decide nothing. If you all are the only people to police yourselves in executive session, if you go in for one of those stated six reasons and someone goes to bring up something else that isn't one of the reasons for being in executive session, you all need to stop the executive session. You can come out and then make another motion to go right back into executive session for another permissible reason. But you can't be in there talking about other things. Um, a violation of the privilege of executive session. So if we were in executive session right now, which we're not, but if we were, and we're having a conversation, and one of you were to go and start talking about what happened in executive session in the public, that's criminal. So charges can be pressed against you for that violation of the privilege of executive session, right? Um, so just know that. However, if you're in executive session for impermissible reasons and someone rats you out to be very one, then it's not criminal for them coming after you for that because you weren't in there legitimately in there. Okay. Um, case law examples, again, I'm not trying to beat a dead horse here. I am trying to just make sure it's January. Y'all just heard a lot of COVID numbers and now you have an attorney talking sunshine laws and public records. Just trying to hit the highlights on here. We did talk about public participation. You do have policies on this, um, which I believe I have on here. Oh, God awful print, but you do have it and feel free to send the presentation out again after. What I will tell you about public participation. If you let people speak, you let them speak. They have no right to engage in a question and answer session. I understand that you all are on the board because you love children, you love education, and you wanna help the community. At least that would be my assumption, right? And so in those moments, 
sometimes it can feel like people in public participation are there attacking, they're, they're very angry, they can be very mad, aggressive, for any of the number of reasons. Simply because they're mad doesn't give you the right to stop them. Simply because they're sort of irritated about one of your policy decisions doesn't give you the right to stop them. So oftentimes we will tell you to let them have their three minutes, which I believe is what you have in policy. <laughs> Say thank you very much and be done. It's not one to engage and it's also not one to stop them because if you stop them, you could be violating their First Amendment right of freedom of speech. And so we just need to be very clear on that. If we allow people to say accolades about our staff members, probably need to allow them to say the negatives as well. And so that can feel not great when you're in those meetings, um, especially because we try to point that to the superintendent for complaints so that they can be properly resolved in the employment matters. Okay. Questions on public participation? Sunshine laws? Open meetings? At least not that you're going to ask in a public meeting? Yeah. <laughs> Come on, guys. <laughs> Is that part of the executive session? Is that one of the six options? Is one of the six <laughs> options, yes, please. Um, school levy campaign compliance, be careful with this, y'all. Be very, very careful. And so to at least know the statutes that are on there for use of school funds, you cannot use any Reading Community School right. Funds to support the passage or oppose the passage of a levy or bond issue. Right. It sounds very ridiculous that you are asking the community for money, and yet you cannot support your ask. I understand that, but that's the way that the laws are written. So it is what it is. If there is an exception that you can permit any of your employees to attend a public meeting during regular working hours for the purpose of presenting information about your school finances and activities and board actions, even if the purpose of the meeting is to discuss or debate the passage of a school levy or bond issue, okay? You can allow them to do that. But what I will tell you is if you allow your employees to go during the workday for a pro levy meeting where they can hear about your school and your finances, you are going to allow them to do an anti levy meeting just the same, okay? So we tend to say after school hours, don't do it during school. Not many people do. Um, same thing when you allow for people to take money out of their paychecks for um, the levy campaign, it means you also allow them to take it out for the anti-levy campaign. Okay. Um, already talked about that sound, but you can, and this one I will say there's a bit of an asterisk on it right now because of some current litigation that's come out in the last month or two. Um, you can use public funds to publish, distribute newsletters, other items about your plans, policies, and operations of the district, right? Where the funds are going, where the funds are needed type of thing with people who are affected by you. You can publish information, but be very clear when you're looking at those notices, I vet them by legal, not to run up a bill, but to make sure that you all don't violate any of the, the laws with regard to this. Because you can't do anything that su supports or opposes the passage of a levy or bond issue. Information only, information only, information only. Okay. So you can do newsletters, financial reports, you can do all your board actions, policies, and procedures. Um, you can advance awareness of your programs and what your operations, what will happen with the funds and what will happen if the funds aren't obtained, right? You can talk about all of that, but we just need to be very clear about the anti-levy sort of message that could go along with that, very, very clear. Information versus support is where we tend to focus on what that messaging looks like. Information is great, support is not. You cannot post any materials that support or oppose the passage of a levy or bond on the school district's social media accounts. I've seen some of them go up before and then you get the phone call from the attorney saying, please take it down immediately, you can't do that. Facebook, Twitter, all the things. Um, if as an administrator or as an employee, you have a personal Twitter account, because that's what we all tend to have now. I don't know, Facebook almost seems like a thing of the past, but personal Facebook, personal Twitter, and we put it out there in our personal capacity. You can do anything you want, Jason Collette, after school hours to promote the levy, after you're not being paid by the district. 